If you've ever fired a gun, seen someone fire a gun, or understand at all what a gun is, you'll know that when you fire a bullet forward, the gun slams backwards, and you absorb this force in your shoulder. This is called recoil, and it's an unfortunate side effect of Newton's third law. Every action must have an equal and opposite reaction. The momentum imparted on the bullet to make it go forward is equal and opposite to the momentum imparted on the gun that makes it go backwards. And this applies to big guns as well. For an artillery piece or a gun to be any good, i.e. throw the projectile out at an acceptable speed, the chamber pressures that build up behind the projectile have to be huge. This pressure only has a few milliseconds to act on the base of the projectile before it leaves the barrel, and while it's doing so, it's also imparting a massive amount of force on the rear of the chamber. For hundreds of years, this force was just accepted. Field guns or naval cannons rolled around after firing and needed re-sighted each time. Modern artillery pieces use shock absorbers to lessen the impact of recoil on the gun, but the breech, barrel and recoil mechanisms still have to absorb large forces, and these guns are, therefore, very heavy. This meant that it was incredibly difficult to mount them onto aircraft. Machine guns were really the heaviest armament you could ever get on, say, a World War I era biplane. But machine guns aren't going to do much against something like a Zeppelin, loitering menacingly over your capital city, dropping bombs. Luckily, Commander Cleland Davis had come up with a relatively large caliber gun that had no recoil, by attaching an identical gun onto the back of it. The projectiles in the Davis gun were pretty typical, but at the bottom of the round they had a wad of grease and lead balls that weighed the same as the projectile. The premise was, if you shoot something of the same weight in the exact opposite direction as the projectile at the same time, the force is balanced and you don't have much recoil. When you pulled the trigger and ignited the propellant, it shot the projectile out one end, hopefully into a zeppelin, and the counterweight sprayed out the other. The principle of recoilless guns was incredibly important, the Davis gun was not. In the end, it was planned to be mounted on a series of bizarre little aircraft like the AD Scout and the Roby Peters gun carrier, but development largely stopped with the end of the war. And to be honest, that might have been for the best, as the design had a few massive flaws. Firstly, shooting a projectile out the back of your gun has the potential to cause some issues for those around you. There was also the problem that the chamber of the Davis gun in the centre was put under massive stresses, as it was, essentially, dealing with the force of firing two guns at once, and, by design, it couldn't be thickened to compensate for this, because then it would be too heavy to fly. Research into recoilless gun technologies continued in peacetime though, with the Soviet Union showing serious interest in the concept and referring to them as Dynamo Reaktivnaya Pushka, or Dynamic Reaction Cannons. They mounted them on tanks, planes, boats, and in bunkers. And these worked using a different principle that has been used ever since, using the gas generated by the burning propellant to balance the gun. The shell casing would be perforated to allow the gas to vent sideways and be directed backwards out of the rear of the rifle through an expansion chamber. All this would have been designed in a very clever way, using numbers and maths that meant the force of firing the projectile, acting backwards, would be balanced by the force of the propellant gas escaping out the back, which would act forwards. That's how modern recoilless guns work anyway. These early Soviet designs used a combustible sleeve instead of a casing allowing the gas to escape past the sleeve as it degraded. These worked comically poorly, leading to their designer, Leonid Kurchevsky, being arrested and all his DRP guns being destroyed. The idea of recoilless weapons lost a lot of credibility. Yes, they were a lot lighter and more compact than normal guns, but the muzzle velocity of these early weapons was unacceptably low, meaning they had very poor armour penetration, accuracy and range. The anti-tank rifle seemed to be the superior option, but it didn't stay that way for long. Before I explain why, here's a question for you. Have you ever googled your own name, or even your email address? What you'll likely find are data broker websites, who sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. For example, my friend Rose lives in Florida. When I google her name, 
I get everything. Her full name, email, home address, health records, phone number, relatives, people she lived with, even estimated monthly rent, it's all there. And that's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. Data breaches are happening constantly. This AT&T breach included 73 million customer records, with existing and previous customers having their information released onto the internet and the dark web. AT&T recommended that those affected use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. Well, Aura does this all for me. And best of all, I don't have to download several different apps just because a company couldn't keep my data secure. If my info was compromised in the AT&T data breach, I wouldn't worry, because Aura is always on, always doing the hard work of keeping me safe. I value my privacy, I value my friends, and I value yours. You can go to aura.com forward slash redwrenchfilms to start your two-week free trial. Also linked below in the description. Despite the failure of the DRP guns, the Germans began using 75mm recoilless guns in the 40s to support their airborne troops, seeing success on Crete and prompting development of larger, more sophisticated weapons. Naturally, Nazi Germany took this to the extreme, as they are known to do, and mounted a 355mm recoilless gun onto the bottom of a Dornier 217. It was not a success. But anyway, by the end of the war, both sides were using heat shells high explosive anti-tank. These were game changers because they worked effectively at punching holes into enemy armour no matter how fast they were going. This new shell meant that recoilless rifles were back. During the Cold War, every major power operated infantry recoilless rifle systems at some point. They were light, cheap and reliable, and could be mounted on anything you could name. Even a Vespa apparently, if you're feeling especially French. The performance of heat shells led to many countries deciding that tank armour wasn't even worth having, resulting in fast, lightly protected vehicles like the AMX-30 or the Leopard. The Soviets resumed their interest, developing infantry recoilless gun systems like the 73mm SPG-9, the 82mm B-10 and the 107mm B-11. The British, meanwhile, developed a 120mm recoilless rifle system to replace the 17-pounder known as the Wombat, weapon of magnesium, battalion, anti-tank, which, as the name suggests, were constructed from magnesium alloys to make them even lighter. The Wombat fired 120mm Hesch rounds to distances of up to 1800 meters. The US, of course, also had mature designs, such as the M67 and the M40, 90mm and 106mm recoilless guns respectively. They even slapped six M40 guns onto an 8-ton chassis and called it the M50 Ontos, which was largely used to sling an obscene amount of arrow-filled canister rounds at the enemy during the Vietnam War. You can't hide in the trees if there are no trees, after all. Heat and Hesh had largely solved the armour penetration problem, but recoilless guns still had quite poor accuracy due to the reduced muzzle velocities. The invention and widespread adoption of guided missiles meant that the recoilless gun craze was quickly put to a stop. Missiles were more accurate, had longer range, and the apparatus to fire them was even lighter than that of a recoilless. It was so over. But like all weapons, they still have their uses. For example, for militaries operating in the Arctic, they are still in vogue, as the electronics and many missile systems simply will not function properly at such low temperatures. Also, missile systems do work quite poorly at very short ranges, so recoilless guns can be used effectively in an ambush roll where their accuracy is still very good. You can slap it onto the back of your Toyota and still have a credible anti-tank platform. The Wikipedia page for recoilless rifles even suggests that an M40 armed technical fulfills a similar combat role to an attack helicopter, which I find really funny. I think I'd be choosing the Apache over the Hilux. But anyway, they are also used extensively as shoulder-launchable anti-tank weapons. 
The 84mm Carl Gustav is the most obvious example, firing a whole host of specialised rounds. It was developed further into the single-use AT4. The RPG-7 is also technically a recoilless gun system, as an explosive charge fires the round out of the tube, with many rounds then activating a rocket motor once they are airborne. Operating these guns in enclosed spaces can be a nightmare though, with the backblast of the propellant gases being lethal if you find yourself behind the shooter. But there is a solution, a modern Davis gun known as Armbrust or Crossbow. The Armbrust launcher is more complex. It places the propellant charge between two captive pistons. The projectile goes in front of the forward piston and a wad of shredded plastic or tungsten powder of equal weight goes behind the rear piston. When the arm burst is fired, the propellant gas expands, pushing the projectile and counterweight out each end of the weapon and jamming the pistons at the ends of the tube, trapping the hot gases inside. The counterweight cloud is slowed almost immediately by air resistance, making it harmless after a relatively short distance and creating a nice confetti effect. A fitting end to the video. Congratulations, you too now know a useless amount about recoilless gun and rifle systems. This video was originally part of a collaboration I did with Lord Hard Thresher, so do check him out if you haven't already. If you aren't subscribed, it would be great if you consider it, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd also consider supporting the channel on Patreon, getting these videos early and ad-free for as little as $2. Look, you even get your name at the end. Thank you so much to my existing Patreon supporters, I love and cherish you all. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.